Welcome. Hey, good to see you today. Thanks for joining us. We are so happy that you could be with us today. And uh, Jeremy mentioned our live outdoor 8 o'clock service. And this Sunday was the first opportunity that I had to speak to a live audience in a long time. And I, I just have this warning for you pastors, when you finally get to speak live with your congregations, be careful, don't hurt yourself. It's exciting, it's awesome to be able to connect live with people. Well, we're glad that you're with us here today and we're excited to have you as well. We've got people from uh, not only here locally, but across the state, across the nation, and even around the world. We welcome you, glad that you are joining us here today. What an exciting time to be serving Jesus Christ. Amen. So welcome. We're glad that you could be with us. Have you ever wondered what would compel someone to risk their life to climb a dangerous mountain? In 1923, when asked why he was trying to climb Mount Everest, George Mallory famously replied, because it's there. Although Mallory perished the following year on Everest, his response captures that childlike wonder of doing something just for the fun of it, but also that adult ideal of dedicating oneself to meeting a challenge, no matter how great that challenge is. Last summer, I was privileged to join the ministry of Exodus Vision, led by our very own Dr. Faustin Uzebekilio, and we were training a group of pastors in Kasungu, Malawi, Africa, and the area actually is quite flat, except for this one lone mountain. So what did we do? Well, one day after our sessions, we climbed it. Why did we do it? As Mallory said, because it's there. The mountain was calling and we were compelled to climb it. Well, there was a village at the base of the mountain and as we passed through, this group of kids began to gather with us and they ended up climbing the mountain with us thus capturing this childlike whimsy of doing something for the fun of it, but also the adult heroic idea of dedicating ourselves to meeting a challenge. It's no secret that I love to hike. And so often on my days off, which is Monday, I will go up to the mountains, the local San Gabriel mountains, and I, I will hike. And so this past Monday, I went up to enjoy a hike, and actually the trail that I was taking on Monday, uh, I had to walk about three quarters of a mile uphill. It was kind of hot that day, and in order to get to the trailhead. And so as I'm trekking up to the trailhead, I'm asking myself this question, why do I do this? Why do I love to hike so much? And so I, I think my answer is a little bit more, more complex than Mallory's. And uh, so I, I came up with a few reasons that I, I love to hike. One is the companionship, the camaraderie. And I want to just take a moment here to give a shout out to my hiking buddies, Michael and Keith and Laura and Mandy and Andrew and, and even my wife, if the trail is easy enough. But yeah, companionship, camaraderie. I also love to be outside. I love to be in nature. You know, the physical exercise, the physical exertion. And I tend to like those hikes that, that have a payoff. You know what I'm talking about, the hikes that have this spectacular view somewhere along the way, or maybe there's a waterfall. But when it's all said and done, I think I love to hike because it's a parody of life. It, you know, sometimes just enjoying the journey along the way. And in some parts of the world, and in some cultures, people actually climb mountains to be close to God. It's a spiritual experience. So there are those in the Bible who were challenged to climb a mountain as well. Think about 
Abraham, who was compelled to climb Mount Moriah to offer his, his son Isaac on the altar. And then Moses was also compelled to climb Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. And then later in his life to climb Mount Nebo so he could get a view over into the Promised Land. And then, of course, Jesus was compelled to climb Golgotha, a hill outside of Jerusalem, carrying the cross upon which he would be crucified. See, these mountains represent challenge, hardship, and sacrifice. We all, every single one of us, have a mountain to climb. All of us. Not only are we compelled to climb these mountains, to overcome these obstacles and challenges in our life, but as we climb them, we are also compelled to pray. Because if you're like me, somewhere along the way, we realize that in order to be able to complete the journey, we need God. We need His help. Even Jesus, prior to climbing Golgotha, was compelled to pray. He gathered his disciples and he prayed the greatest prayer that's ever recorded. This prayer can be found in the book of John, the 17th chapter. It's one of the loftiest passages in the entire Bible. The words are indeed sacred and reveal, I believe, the heart of Jesus in such a unique way. In this prayer, Jesus prays for his followers just before being betrayed and arrested. And it's abundantly clear that he's not just praying for those who are with him on that fateful night as they shared the Passover meal, but he was also praying for you and for me. He said as much. In John 17, 20, he says, I am praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. That all means you. It means me. And I don't know what that, how deeply that touches you. It touches me very deeply because I, I'm recognizing here that Jesus prayed for me. And I want you to know, friend, he prayed for you. Matter of fact, the scripture goes on to say that he ever lives to make intercession for us. Knowing that his death was imminent, you and I were on his mind. His final thoughts here on earth were not upon himself, but they were upon us. How is that for love? So Jesus' words also give us insight as to how we are to pray. And there's a certain structure about his prayer that I want us to take a deeper dive into together today. And the first is this, Jesus looked upward. And here's what it looks like in his prayer, beginning John 17, verses 1 through 5. He says, it says, after this, he looked up toward heaven and prayed. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you, for you've granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life that they know you, the, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do, and now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Did you notice in that passage a number of times the word glory or glorify appears? There's a great lesson to be learned by this example that our first priority in life and in prayer is to glorify God. We were created to that end. And then Jesus, earlier in his ministry, he, his disciples were asking him, Lord, how do we pray? And so he modeled this for them, and the prayers found in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, it begins like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He taught them to begin 
their conversation with Almighty God by worship, by glorifying Him, by praising Him. In Psalms, it's recorded, whoever offers praise, the Lord says, glorifies me. And so why did Jesus begin his prayer with praise and why should we live such a life? Well, first of all, in praising God, we declare his sovereignty and we recognize his nature and his power. But secondly, in praising God, we shift our attention off of ourselves and on to God. I mean, I think this is so crucial for us to hear and understand and embrace and graft into our own lives today because I, I, I think this is so apparent in, in Peter's life when he was challenged to step out of the boat. The wind and the waves were, were, were crashing around him and he was walking toward Jesus and as long as he kept his eyes upon Jesus, everything was all right. But when he looked down and he took his eyes off Jesus, he, he found himself beginning to sink. See, in praising God, we shift our attention off of ourselves and on to God. And then also, when we praise God, we invite His presence into our lives, into the situation, into our time with Him. The Scripture teaches us God inhabits the praises of His people. And so no matter what you're going through today, if you will if you will begin to worship and praise and glorify and magnify Almighty God, things will begin to, to change in your, at least in your thinking and most likely even in the situation that you're dealing with in your life. I mentioned that I was out hiking on, on Monday and I was just enjoying myself so much. I was enjoying the spectacular view over our valley going a little bit further, I, f I found some beautiful flowers and I, I got down on the ground so I could take a really nice uh, photograph of those, those flowers. And I was just uh, generally having just a great time out, out, there, out there hiking. And, but at one point, I just kind of, I must have been inside of my head and I was thinking and as I was walking along and looking down, and then all of a sudden, I looked up. I looked up and I saw a deer in the trail ahead of me, just hopping down the trail in front of me, had I continued to look down, I would have missed it. And I think that's a great lesson for us because sometimes we just get, we're, we're focused on the situation, the problem, and, and, and even just work and all the stuff that we do, I think every once in a while we just need to stop and look up. See, Jesus' example of looking upward has everything to do with not focusing on the problem or situation, but looking to Jesus, the Bible says, the author and finisher of our faith. Looking upward also has to do with gaining an eternal perspective. The second part of this prayer reveals that Jesus looked outward. You see, prayer can sometimes be reflective and introspective, but here Jesus is modeling empathy, thinking about the needs, concerns, burdens, difficulties of others. And so Jesus prays for several things regarding his followers. The first of these is protection, protection. I think this is important for us to hear today that especially when there's the threat of, of sickness and disease that we, we need to understand that Jesus prayed for your protection. We've been doing a food pantry here at the Highlands and what we're doing is we're having cars drive up and they pop the trunk and we put the food in the trunk and, and as we're putting the food in the trunk, we'll go up to them and we'll say, can we pray for you? Not one time have people refused to have us pray for them. And I find myself in that situation as I pray for these, these precious people that are in our community in need. I find myself praying for their protection. I'm praying, God, would you keep this family safe, free from disease, from sickness, 
praying for their protection. In Jesus' prayer in John 17, 11 to 12, it looks like this. He says, I will remain in the world no longer. In other words, Jesus was getting ready to leave. He was going to be crucified. He was going to be resurrected. He was going to leave the, the, these disciples. And so he's saying, I'm not going to be in the world any longer, but they are still in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name and the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, Jesus was saying, I protected them and kept them safe by that name that you gave me. None has been lost except the, the one doomed to destruction so that the scriptures could be fulfilled. And then again in the 15th verse, he says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. And I, I want to pause right here because in, in our 8 o'clock service today, I looked out over over those that were, had gathered, and I saw law enforcement. I, I want to say to you law enforcement that are with us here today, we, first of all, we love you and we thank you and we value what you're doing to keep our community safe. And we know that it's not easy out there and we know that it's dangerous, but I want to encourage you with this, that God, his hand of protection is upon you. And I looked out uh, this morning at the, at the group that had gathered and I saw people that are doctors and nurses that are part of the medical field. And, and, I, and I said to them, and I want to say to those of you that are part of the medical field, I want to say that God's hand of protection is upon you. Thank you for doing what you're doing to serve our community, putting yourself at risk thank you, but also be encouraged that Jesus prayed for you, that you would be safe and protected. And of course, I looked out and I saw all the teachers. We have a lot of teachers that are part of the Highlands Church family, and maybe you're watching today, and I know that schools are getting ready to start, and it's challenging, and it's difficult because we're doing this whole online thing with the students, and it's challenging, but I want to I let you know, especially you, you middle school and high school teachers, God's hand of protection is upon you. The first idea of protection or safekeeping is like that of a shepherd watching over his flock. And we're reminded of what David said. He, he said, the Lord is my shepherd. I love that. Secondly, the idea of protection is that of a father. In verse 11, we, we will notice that Jesus said, Holy Father, would you protect them? The role of an earthly father and our heavenly father is to protect, to guard, to keep his children safe. And it's uplifting to know that God is the sentinel who stands guard over our lives, protecting us from the onslaught of the enemy, certainly spiritually. But I think during this time, it's also important that we know he stands as a sentinel to guard us also emotionally and physically. Jesus also prayed for unity. He prayed a number of times that his followers would be one. In verse 11, he said, so that they may be one as we are one. And then in verse 21, he prayed that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I in you. And then in verse 22, he goes on to pray, I have given them the glory that you gave to me that they may be one as we are one. Do you, do you hear and feel the intensity with which Jesus is praying for unity? And in verse 23, he goes on to say, I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity, then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. 
What I love about these statements is that it makes it abundantly clear that the unity God desires is based on a unity that already exists in heaven between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It is the very nature of God. So the question is, how can we attain unity? I think it, it, it can begin, there's an epicenter called the family. We can pray for unity within our homes. As believers, we can model what unity looks like within the context of our families. And then also, we can attain unity as we learn to listen to others. We can seek to understand. We can love. We can invite others who are different than we are to the table. Notice that Jesus didn't pray necessarily for harmony, that we'd all get along. He prayed a deeper prayer, a prayer for unity. See, because we're not always going to agree on all things, but that doesn't mean that we can't have unity. Twice he says that we are to unite as witnesses to the unbeliever. He says, so the world may believe that you sent me. In John 13, 35, Jesus also said, all people will know that you are my followers if, if you love each other. See, according to Jesus' words, unity leads to faith. Conversely, disunity fosters doubt and skepticism. And I would say to believers today, the reputation of God is at stake when it comes to unity. See, Jesus also prayed that we might be filled with joy. In verse 13, he says, I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy. See, joy is the byproduct of a relationship with Jesus Christ. The joy we're talking about finds its source in Jesus, that they may have the full measure of my joy. How much joy? The full measure, like a cup that's running over. The psalmist said, my cup overflows. And so Jesus looked upward, outward, and thirdly, the scripture reveals Jesus looked forward. See, we must be careful not to get stuck in the past. Whether it's past accomplishments or past failures, as Jesus did, we must look forward. I mean, think about this. We, we drive in automobiles that have this great big windshield that we look out to see where we're going, and we have these little bitty rearview mirrors. And rearview mirrors are helpful. I mean, we look in our rearview mirrors to gain perspective, to see where we've been. But think about this. What if you got in your car and you began to drive down the road and instead of looking out the, wind, the windshield, you focused solely on the rearview mirror? I mean, how would that work? It wouldn't be long before you went off the road in a ditch or it wouldn't be long before you rear-ended someone or veered over into a lane and, and have a head-on collision. The lesson is this. An occasional glance in the rearview mirror is helpful, but we can't drive down the road looking at the past only. God has this great, big, marvelous future. Let's, let's look forward. In this prayer, Jesus was commissioning his followers to tell everyone everywhere about the saving grace of God. In other words, Jesus was saying, look forward. 
Look forward. And in his prayer in verse 18, it looks like this. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. And dear friend, today, if you're a believer and, and, and you're participating in, in this gathering with us today, I want you to say this right where you are. I want you to say, I'm sent. I've been sent into the world. In Matthew's gospel, it looks like this. Jesus said, again, some of the last words that he would speak, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. You see, we have a mission to carry the gospel to the world. That's why we go to Southeast Asia that's why we go to Africa. That's why we go to Haiti. That's why we do a food pantry. That's why we do what we do. That's why when the coronavirus hit and we were restricted from being able to have in-person services, we didn't stop. We're, we're never going to stop until Jesus comes to return it and, and take away his, his bride, his church. We're not going to stop. We're going to continue because we have a mission to carry the gospel into all the world and our mission can be summed up in one word and that word is people we have been called commissioned by God to reach people to love people to help people to be with people we must realize that this sending out is for every believer, not just a few. It's for all of us. We, every single one of us, are God's messengers. Jesus prayed for you. He prayed that you would be able to share this good news with friends, family, and those around you. With this prayer as a model, our prayers are to reflect the will of God, not our own will. You see, Jesus has a much higher purpose in mind than merely taking care of our needs and wants. Don't get me wrong. He does that. But he wants so much more than that for us. He shows that prayer's highest aim is not for our will to be done, but that the will of God be done here on earth. And so we come back to this statement made in his prayer. I am praying not only for these disciples, but for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Do you want to know how to get on Jesus' prayer list? believe in him that's where it all begins that's where it all starts and I know that there are some that are, are, are with us today and you've never taken the opportunity to express your faith in God alone before we finish here today I want to give you that opportunity we're going to pray inviting Jesus to come into our lives. And I'm inviting you, dear one, to pray that prayer with us. But also, I want each and every one of us to contemplate what God is speaking to us about today. Maybe you need to look up. You need to look up. You've been focusing on the problems and the situations and the stress, stressful things in your life and and the Lord's challenging you, look up, look up. Maybe you just need to recognize that Jesus prayed for your protection, that his hand is upon your life, that he is there with you. 
Or maybe he's challenging you to look forward. Maybe you've been living in the past. Maybe you have been with you've been withheld by your failures of the past. I want you to know you can move past those. Stop driving down the road looking in the rearview mirror. There's a great big world out there that God created for you to enjoy. So my challenge to all of us today is to open our hearts and to put our faith in Christ. So for those of you that have never prayed that prayer inviting Christ into your life, I'm inviting you to do that. Just wherever you are, close your eyes. Pray these words with me. Father, thank you for loving me the way that you do. Today I receive that love in my life. Would you forgive me of my sins? Thank you for dying on the cross so that I could be free from those sins. I invite you to come into my life, into my heart. Put your Holy Spirit within me so that I can walk with you for the rest of my life. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.